Many people think education is important. I don't think so. I don't think education is important. Why it's not important? Because we cannot say uh, uh, oxygen and water is important to us, simply. So, therefore, I totally believe that education is a necessity for us to live, to progress, and to proceed with life as well. I have been studying for more than six years between classrooms and other classrooms, and I have been uh, uh, going to conferences and doing a lot of research. I did learn. I did learn. But afterwards, I got the best coach and the best teacher for me ever is my bike, is my bicycle. I decided after my travel, uh, my study in the States to start traveling with my bike. I have, an, I have opened the doors in Mexico City. I ended up in Ushuaia. Anyone knows Ushuaia? Where is Ushuaia located? The most southern place in the world, in Argentina, South Argentina. I stopped there, and then I remember when I looked at the ocean and the Pacific Drake, I remember. I remember that the people that I have seen, the places I have witnessed, the museums, the landscapes, all of these is the best lessons in my life and the best teaching of my life. I was very happy to have uh, to collaborate with the Wise in the past couple of months, and then we we went to Rwanda. We went to cycling across Rwanda with the coach, the bike. We were 17 of us men from Qatar. I remember we visit school every day. We had school to visit and to see and stuff. I remember this accident only. In a classroom that has more than. And in, in, in a big hall that we, 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 we have been welcomed by the students, by the uh, uh, officials of that school. And then we sat on the tables, the 17 of us are here, and the whole podium is there. And then one girl, one girl stood up in the middle of the crowd, and she, had, she, and she said, I have a question for all of you, all of us. She had a question for us. And she did ask, why? There are no women among you. She's nine years old, ladies and gentlemen. And then, despite our answer to her, to see in the most remote place in Rwanda, in Africa, a woman, a girl, she's nine years old, to stand up in the middle of the crowd and she asks, why there are no women among you? What's, what messages that gives you? That's yes, they have the right to do whatever men do. Yes, we are equal, and yes to quality. 30 years, 30 years, 30 years pass. Ladies and gentlemen, the only professional sport women were golfers and tennis players. And where did we reach now? We reached to equality in sport. We reach that women, they have the right to compete equally with men in, in Formula One, in, uh, uh, in a rally motorbike, and uh, even horse racing, competing equally. And then we see the last Women World Cup, the viewership of that, uh, the, that World Cup is 1.1 billion people have seen that World Cup, and it's coming. That sign gives me, it motivated me when she said, where is our right? Therefore, the first thing from that question, the first thing when I arrived to Doha, I start reforming a woman cycling club that I have, been, I have announced it three weeks ago. A woman cycling club. We have now in that club 109 women from all over Qatar. And then we are preparing the same trip to go to Rwanda and to visit the same school and to see the same girl with more than 20 uh, women uh, 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 cycling around the world. Uh, my father, he always, he, he did tell me a lot of things and my mother told me a lot of things. 
about how to be educated, how to do this and that and this and that. But I never learned until the day that I have met my coach, my bicycle. I have cycled more than 50,000 kilometers all over the world. If you can see the, uh, 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 some footage on the screens, that I have been cycling all over the world to see places, to see people, to talk to them. I think that could be the best lesson ever in my life. It made me accept the other. It made me, it made me, it, it, did, uh, uh, it did reform me to be a part of Qatar vision in 2030. Now we are part of that vision. Now Qatar is so, uh, 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 we see the ambitions of Qatar is, is, is proceeding to have equality, the gender equality. And we are part of this and we, we are very happy uh, to see this uh, progress and I'm very happy to, see, to, to be a part uh, of this. Now education is not in the old, uh, old days. Now we see a lot of things could teach us a lot. We see a lot of things could, we could learn a lot. But how, in which angle we will see it? We are here standing in wise. How to be creative with education? How to, be, how to move forward? How to see things uh, differently uh, with education? So we see a lot of uh, uh, accident that we don't see it from the right angle that could change uh, our life. Uh, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so happy uh, to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So before uh, starting this uh, session, I would like to give a small brief about myself. My name is Mohammed Saidun Kawari. And I'm a sports TV presenter working for Bean Sports, presenting the Champions League and the Premier League. Now I would like to welcome Dr. Jamila Mahmoud. She is the Under Secretary of International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent, IFRC. Please welcome her. First of all, welcome to Qatar. Great to have you here. Yes. Thank you. So, before uh, talking uh, in details, you have a fantastic uh, career. You've been a board member in a lot of NGOs. You've been working with uh, peace, education, equality. So, before going into details, please tell us more about what you do and the best you have achieved so far. Do you mind if I walk around? Because Feel yeah. free. Thank you. <laughs> But so, then I have to stand up next to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. I feel really bad because I have my back uh, behind all of you. So, I am uh, working in the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, and this is uh, the oldest humanitarian network in the world. We are 100 years old, and we are a membership organization with 192 national societies uh, around the world of course, including Qatar Red Crescent Society. So my work involves really looking at you know, strategies, policies, youth innovation, gender equality, but also looking at uh, supporting national societies to be able to be uh, functioning well and to be deliver assistance. Everywhere you go in the world, there is a Red Cross or Red Crescent Society. Everywhere, even the most remote places, there will be one. So we as a membership organization support them. You know the GA as a program, as an initiative for sure. sure. You know they are, that everyone is expecting the World Cup to be held here in yes. Qatar three years from now, exactly three years from now, starting yes. from today. So tell us more about, uh, about the sport, about the effect of sport, about how can we generate more than a sport event for this region, for the whole world, starting from the World Cup. Maybe before I tell you about sports, let's, let's reflect on the world right now. We live in a world right now with seven plus billion people and 1.6 billion of these people are young. And the World Economic Forum did a piece of research, which is really important, that comparing a generation, one generation ago, which is about 25 years, where 30% of young people felt they wanted to contribute to something that is important and of global good, today, 60% of young people want to contribute to something that is important and of global, uh, that is contributing to global good. So you do have 1.6 billion people, 60% of whom, who want to do something good. And sports is a fantastic medium for young people to engage in. 
So for us as the Federation, we have been working on sports, not just in terms of um, health, which is very important because uh, sports and healthy lifestyle is important for everyone, but also sports and social inclusion. Uh, when we talk about, and I love the story about you know, how you include women in cycling, but if you look at gender, there are many dimensions of gender. It's not just women and men. It's also people with disabilities, uh, people who are uh, marginalized, people living with HIV, people who are you know, LGBTI. There are all sorts of dimensions to, to gender. So if I can share some stories. Feel free. Um, in Lesvos, which is a, an island in Greece, a lot of migrants and refugees arrived. And there are many nationalities there. And you, as you can imagine, you arrive with barely only the clothes on the back. And you have to live in this very, very basic conditions. And it is actually tossing a football around uh, among people who've come from Africa, from the Middle East, from all sorts of places that have been able to allow them to have some form of cohesion, some sort of belonging. And it allows conversations to happen that will you know, reduce the risk of us having... We live in a world now of fear of the other. We don't know how to welcome the stranger in many parts of the world. And I think it's a fantastic opportunity using sports, especially football, which is very portable that you can kick around uh, and get people to have these conversations and to feel included and part of society. A young man called David in, arrived in the UK and he came from... Um, from Africa and he had all sorts of dreams to be going to university but war broke out and he was uh, he fled as a, as a refugee but he loved football so when he arrived in Plymouth what he did was you know went to the refugee camp and gathered young people and he had 50 children you know, young men or young women playing and women as well uh, playing football and later on the people in Plymouth sort of joined in and now they've started a football club called Plymouth Hope football club. So the migrants and refugees then become included in society. But it's very important because football teaches you about team building, it teaches you about acceptance, it teaches about discipline and rules and about you know being able to have a conflict on the field and resolve it at the same time. So there are many opportunities. But one other thing that we must remember is sometimes the ones who you think are probably not going to be able to contribute so much. So we have a fantastic relationship with the Special Olympics and the Special Olympics are children with uh, and adults with intellectual disabilities. So even in the disability arena, there's also discrimination against intellectual disabilities. When you talk about people who have uh, disabilities, you know, who aren't able to walk or run, but those with intellectual disabilities are so often hidden from society. So what we've done, and I remember this young girl called Isabel from Indonesia, who we trained as a sports person, but she also trained to be a first aid responder. So we have now 200 special needs children with intellectual disabilities that can save your life because they are trained in first aid. So there's so many ways we can use sports. And I think, you know, Qatar hosting the World Cup in 2020 the work that the Gen uh, Supreme Committee, the Generation Amazing, the Legacy Project, is going to be so critical because people have to remember, you know, the emotions that you're left behind after a major sports event. Ali earlier mentioned the viewership of the Women World Cup reaching more than 1.1 billion. Yeah. We also saw a, a fantastic example of the Winter Olympics 2018 with a team participating under the refugee team. Absolutely. We also saw a lot of fantastic examples. World Cup, we remember the game between Iran and America yes. in the World Cup 1998. Yes. And a lot of good examples where football and sport brought peace to the world. Absolutely. And North Korea and South Korea coming as a unified Korean team to the Olympics. I think that, you know, as I said before, we have, we have and I'm making a generalization now, that there is a fear of the other, the, 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 the lack of ability to welcome someone different. And I think sports has an incredible opportunity to unite all of us, irrespective of your belief, your nationality, your skin color, whatever, your gender, that you can actually come together, you know, to enjoy, you know, playing on the pitch or on the court or, and, and competing in a, in a friendly way or even in a competitive way, but having that discipline that acceptance, you know, that sports brings. So if we take 
the World Cup, as an example, mm -hmm. three years from now, World Cup will be here. Yep. When Qatar started bidding for the World Cup, there was a clear message that this part of the world needs to host the World Cup because of the love of the football and because of the magic of football for this region. What lessons, what legacy you think World Cup as a fantastic, a huge event can leave for this region and for the whole of Asia? Well, let me be perfectly frank. Uh, this is a very hot region, not just temperature-wise, uh, but uh, a majority of the conflicts in the world happen in this region. Um, a lot of the conflicts obviously are political, but it also leads to many people you know, having fear of the other, other person or the other country or you know, being suspicious and so on and so forth. I think what the, the World Cup can do is many, many, many things. I think on, on the gender dimensions, bringing you know, what we would love to do, and we're in discussions now to work with uh, the Qatar World Cup uh, like, uh, Supreme Committee, is you know, how do we bring people to enjoy the journey of the World Cup? World Cup and play football, you know, whether they're refugees, they're homeless, they're migrants, they're, they're, they're marginalized communities, communities, and then, you know, be able to then, you know, um, teach them while they play uh, about values. And I want to come back to what the first speaker said, because he said, you know, he learns from his bicycle. Yes. And education today, I don't know if you've been following Google and, and uh, Pricewaterhouse and many other companies are now saying they're not going to look whether you have an IV League qualification. Pricewaterhouse doesn't even care if you don't have a degree. What's really important in this world today, which is very different, you know, the children who go to school today uh, in primary school. And that's will, why you always talk about youth leadership, right. which can come from sport. And, and the children who are in primary school today will be adults in a world where 60% of the jobs don't exist today. So what do you need to teach children? You need to teach them values. You need to teach them cognitive thinking. thinking. Uh, you need to teach them uh, adaptation, uh, adaptability, innovation. And these are not conventional school subjects. So the education system of today must evolve because it's probably not relevant for the future. So what we can do with football is infuse, and we have something very special in the Red Cross and Red Crescent called Youth as Agents of Behavioral Change where you play a game or you do peer-to-peer -peer work and then in the middle of it you have lessons on gender, on respect, on how do you disagree. You can disagree but how do you have a discourse? How do you have empathy for the other? How do you have mindfulness yeah, so that you yourself as a human being develop in, in the right way? And all of these are available in sport? All <laughs> these are available within the Red Cross and Red Crescent. It is available to the entire sports world. You said this area is hot. Let's have a seat. Thank you. Yeah, and we apologize from our friends behind of us that we will give them our back. And let's uh, welcome our second speaker. Let's welcome Mr. Vladimir uh, Borkovic, and he's the co-founder of Street Football World. Vlad, first of all, welcome to Qatar. Great to have you here. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Good Alaykum afternoon, salam. my friends. So we always hear that the fans are the people who are addicted to football, but their involvement is always least. We can see the decision makers of football, we can see the football club owners, we can see the stars, Messi and Ronaldo, but less involvement of, of fans who are spending most of the money within uh, the industry of football. Tell us more about your initiatives and your experience with football and with football fans. Thank you very much. Good afternoon again. Um, well, I'm originally from a country that does not exist. It was called Yugoslavia. Um, and growing up in a country that felt apart, I had the impression that uh, it, we need some new tools, some new facilitation for this world. Um, that's why Street Football World was founded back in 2002, uh, to prepare, first of all, Germany to become a host for friends and not to be a hostile country who does not, in a way, uh, welcome foreigners. In 2006, we had the first uh, World Cup that was held, uh, especially in Berlin. We had a festival, a youth festival. And this is something that we are repeating throughout the decades. And one of the next will be actually here in Qatar during the FIFA Club World Cup 
uh, in mid-December. And I'm very happy that it will be actually the first U festival around football on the Qatari soil. Um, from there, we began exploring the game of football as a medium. And I'm probably preaching to the converted. You all believe in the power of sport and the power of the game. But let me just emphasize that we should not be naive and believe that football can serve and solve everything. It's not a panacea. It's just about utilizing the game as it is towards positive youth and social development, even community development. My dear colleague Jamila explained to you a few of the aspects how young people can participate. In our network of street football, we have two million young people, equally boys and girls represented, who are transforming their communities. And this is the power of the game. Let's look at two nuances of the game. One is inspiration. How do I attract the young people to other content, like school dropout? We are talking here a lot about it at the Vice Summit. How do we attract young people to understand some health issues and deal with them? How do we attract and inspire young people to be peacefully and coexistent in different environments? How do we attract young migrants, both male and female, to be part of the society? It is the game of football very often that is the only attraction to them. The second aspect is how do we utilize the game as a method, as a methodology, towards some values. And I was reading when preparing for the summit also the Qatar National Vision 2030, also mentioned by my colleague. One of the pillars is social development and one of the aspects is moral values. And my question is always, how do we exactly do that also through education? Do we use some facilitation? Do we use some catalysts? And can sport be one of them? We always believe that in sport we find values that are intrinsic to the game. But my belief is that we actually have to work on them in order to transcend from believers into doers and those who can actually utilize the game, be it football or any other sport, as an educational tool. This is something that we at Street Football World and together with my colleagues from Generation Amazing are doing both worldwide and in the Middle East and across Asia. You mentioned the Qatar Vision 2030. You also have your vision of 2030 and you also have stories of field where you spend more of, of your time, most of your time. So tell us some of these stories, some of the case studies that you, you have seen. First, regarding the Vision 2030, um, it's really great that we, and I think we are, many of us are the survivors of the MDGs, right? So 2015, we, we are still here. They failed, but we are alive. Now, the United Nations have a new agenda uh, accomplished with a set of um, criteria that are called United Nations Global Goals or the SDGs. Um, yes, we believe it's a frame. It's a good framework for us to, to, to continue working towards sustain, sustainable social development. On the other hand, the responsibility cannot only be in the governments. Governments change. Governments change policies. Politicians have often a, a, a difficult way of dealing with reality. We believe that, and you mentioned the fans, that all of us can actually contribute to the global goals and it should be a bottom-up movement, not only a, a top-down. In that sense, you mentioned the viewership of the, of the Women's World Cup. We have the viewership of the Men's World Cup, which is even more. It's four billion people accumulatively watching the game. We believe that in that four million, we actually have actually a big group of people who can contribute to global goals. And it's not about contributing every day. We believe that you should contribute 90 minutes per week. It's the length of the football match, and we will be working towards that. It's called the game of our lives. We believe that we have still 11 years to go until 2030 to play the game of our lives. Back to your question about stories. I mean, you will hear, even from my friend Mahira from Pakistan, her story today. I will not enter into stories that are not mine. Just want to remind us that all over the world, there are 230 million young people who are not in education. We, those who are dealing at in my career with football and in sport in general, have the responsibility to utilize this wonderful game for their better life. And just to quote one of, of our young participants, she's from India, from the region of Jharkhand, Rurka Kalan, Sony is her name. She said when she entered the game, she was able to fulfill a dream and have a smile on her face. And my question to all of us is what is education? What's the end goal? Is it to get them ready for the job market? 
or to let them fulfill their dreams and have a smile on their face. The second one. <laughs> so, we were uh, in 2014 covering the World Cup and we went through some of uh, the poor neighborhood in Brazil where big names and stars came from, Ronaldo, Rivaldo, Ronaldinho. But when you speak to Brazilians, they say that these experiences are very rare. How can we take some of these good examples and try to make more stars and we try to get more benefits from football to the poor neighborhoods, to the poor countries? We started uh, two years ago a special initiative focusing on professional football players, both male and female. We asked them a very simple thing. Um, give back to society 1% of your salary. It's not much, it's 1%. 99% they can do whatever they want. There are many socially conscious players, male and female, who joined that movement. It was started by Juan Mata, the player of Manchester United and Spain. Now we have 130 players, also equally distributed, men and women, who are contributing their time and monetary uh, assets to the development, in particular these areas that you're mentioning. So for us, it's not about creating a new Ronaldo or Rivaldo, or a new Kaká or a new Xavi. It is about utilizing their power, their celebrity status, and at the end also their contribution in, in monetary terms towards social development. The idea is, hopefully, that 2030 will mark a climax that the football industry will say, okay, we are all contributing 1% to social development, we are all contributing 1% to education, we want to utilize the game for the better, and we are conscious that we can do that. With this end, Let's re, uh, be reminded, 2030 marks 100 years of the first World Cup that was played in 1930 in Uruguay. In 2030, I believe we should celebrate global goals and football as the main contributor to the world peace and education of all. And Uruguay is bidding for this World Cup together exactly. with Argentina. And that's also remarkable. Together with Argentina, who is not always the most friendly in, in a way government, but the people like each other and the football game can connect them. What can, what can you tell us about the evolution of Generation Amazing post-World Cup 2022? I hope that I'm well placed to say that uh, as a strategic partner of the Supreme Committee, I'm happy to see a strong impetus that the World Cup is bringing to the region, but also to the world. And that, I would call it a feeling that the Supreme Committee had when launching Generation Amazing is now becoming reality. So far, there were half a million young people reached in six countries across Middle East and Asia. The idea is to expand this both to the region and also go global. And the idea is to have one million young people participating in Generation Amazing programs until 2022. After that, it will be a question not only for Generation Amazing as a program, but also for the Supreme Committee and the state of Qatar, how can we stay involved? in education through football, in social development through football, and in human development through football. And I see here it's about, the question is about how do we become more human. I believe that with the vision of the leadership of the State of Qatar and Supreme Committee, we are getting to a point where we are not talking only about the World Cup, and that will be definitely felt after the World Cup, when the legacy will be stronger than the emotion. And that is something that we, I believe, all should pursue and all should look at that the emotion of the World Cup is transcended towards something that is absolutely tangible. This has started and I really feel in the area here when I'm visiting the country that we are not talking only about football, we are talking about human development and that is something that we have to write with capital letters all across. Perfect. Thank you, Vlad. Sure, sure, sure. Please feel free. I think a piece of advice maybe that here's a real opportunity. There hasn't been a World Cup that had uh, a vision of a legacy, right? So I think that there is a real opportunity for Qatar to actually inspire through the FIFA that whatever happens here must continue. So it has to sustain because otherwise all you get is a one-off project. And what, what you want is a vision that it is, it is a fantastic way to utilize sports or football for global understanding, for peace, for unity, for uh, countering xenophobia, for all the, all the things that are important, for inclusion. And, you know, we, all of us, who believe that sports is a uniting factor, need to stand behind you as Qatar 2020 to say, push FIFA to say, this is a continuing agenda 
you measure every World Cup so that it grows and it, 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 it just, you know, snowballs into a, a fantastic effect. So continuity is needed. Let's welcome now our uh, third speaker. Let's welcome uh, Mahira Ahmed. So Mahira is one of the generation uh, amazing beneficiary from Pakistan. Great to have you here. She's also the president of uh, Women is Nation. And women is a nation. Yes, Women is a Nation. So um, happy to have you here. I've uh, read your uh, story, a fantastic uh, story starting from uh, Pakistan, from uh, Layari. Yes. This is the name of your place, yes. your city, yes. right? Yes. So, so tell us more about your story first. I know you've been uh, teaching young women even before finishing your high school yeah. on the roof of your house. Yes. So um, I started teaching girls when I was in grade 7. I used to teach them at the rooftop of my house. Um, in 2013, I attended a National Youth Peace Festival in which I heard many youth were sharing their inspiring stories. And on my way back to home, I shared it with my father that I want to educate the women of my community. So uh, uh, the idea behind that was when I was in school, there was a girl who was selling ice lollies outside my school. And when I asked her that why you are not coming to school and why you are not getting education, she said that her father died and she and her sibling has to work so they can have food. So that, that thing remained in my mind and, I, I, and then after attending that festival, I thought that I should start working for uh, girls' education. In 2013, I start, founded WIN, and um, after a few months, I, I was threatened by many groups. Um, they were religious groups, they were the gangsters of um, Liari. I, I should uh, give a debrief about Liari. Um, Liari is one of the notorious areas of Pakistan, which is um, always highlighted in news for its, its negative activities. Um, um, uh, people do remember Liari for gangsters and drug dealers. But for me, these small houses in these slums are full of hope and courage. And I feel like the girls, are, uh, the girls of Liari are our future. Nayari, maybe Doctora is, is another example. We saw some fantastic other examples like Stratford, for example, in, in, in London, where a very poor, maybe drug dealer place became the host of, of the Olympics. So we have a lot of good examples from, from sport. Nayari uh, is very famous for its football. The people of Liari are very talented, especially boys. So no cricket? No, no. Okay. They, they are fond of football. They love football. They... Uh, they they are born to play football. Like you can see two two to one point five years old who just start walking. They you can see them in the ground. They don't have shoes to wear. They don't have clothes proper clothes football kits to wear. But you can see them playing in the field. So um, uh, I have been working with Generation Amazing since 2015, and uh, the the thing I like about this project and I love my job because we are including women. We are including women in football. I do remember. Can I share a story? Feel free. Yeah. So um, there is a girl. Her name uh, is Hansa. Um, in our part of the world, girls are girls are uh, uh, forced to marry at the age of 15 and 16 after the periods. So she she was engaged and she was about to get married in, in the age of 16. She participated in Generation Amazing program. She was our junior leader. Uh, there we were sharing the rights of children with them. And then she negotiated with her parents and her mother was in favor of her, but her father was against her. So she negotiated with uh, her father, she talked with her father, and you know what? Her marriage was delayed until she graduates. So this is what the Generation Amazing has brought in, in the girls. So you mentioned having a lot of uh, difficulties. I know that also some people attacked your place where you were teaching girls. What kept you doing what you were doing? 
So um, I was threatened thrice. Um, they they attacked my brother. They took my younger brother with them and they abused him physically. Then they pointed gun on my niece. She was only 1.5 years old at that time. And I do remember that they 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 sexually harassed one of my colleague. Well, she, well, she was teaching voluntarily at my um, school. So I was very frightened and I I I stayed at home for six months. I was not going to uh, college to attend my classes. Then I realized that I should do something. Then um, I started working with Right to Play in Generation Amazing Project, and there I met uh, um, some men. They were they were young influencers of Pakistan, and they were five. Uh, the name of the group was Crazy Five, and I shared um, my story with them that I was doing this and I was doing that, and I loved doing uh, that work. They motivated me. They said that you should start this work again, and I said I'm I'm very frightened and they they can kill me because I do remember the day that they used to send me bullets and white paper that if you will not stop doing that we will kill you so I was very afraid of them but there they were the boys who motivated me and encouraged me to work again for girls I liked your uh, statement girls of Layari are my hope of better tomorrow yes they are. how can we take your story Layari's story to other part of Pakistan and I know that Pakistan um, in terms of uh, women education ranking is, is one of It's the lowest low. in, in yes. the world. Yes. How can we take this to, to other parts of Pakistan and maybe to other countries outside Pakistan? So um, we, we have like in Pakistan there are many organizations and individuals who are working to educate and empower women through the power of education. So what I believe is what we have we have to share it with others. We, we should educate others and um, Um, I, I am crazy about educating and empowering uh, especially girls through the power of education and sports. I, I, I just want to um, um, open many, as many schools as I can in Pakistan because in Pakistan there are four um, educating systems and um, uh, the, the poor are not uh, allowed not allowed maybe they are, they don't get the good education facilities and and for the elite class it's something else so um, i want to work with for them yeah. so they always say that education is like a magic when it comes yes. to to change yes. did you feel this at least in layari within within the past five years yes i i i have seen the enrollment of girls in schools has increased Uh, since last two years and and the government is also working on that and but the the situation of government and public schools is not uh, is not good enough because we we have ghost teachers there they they do abuse children they do punish them and we don't have basic facilities for them Dr. Jamila you are from southeast asia pakistan is not far from there and we know that This area was suffering for many years from wars, but also from, from low education and, and no quality of education. What can you tell us, taking this story as a fantastic example and a message that we can deliver from WISE? Your mic, please. Your mic, please. Please. First of all, Mahira, you know, stay strong. You know, all of us here will be behind you. Thank you. And uh, really admire your, your resilience and your determination. And I Thank absolutely you. agree. Women is a nation. Women are the fabric of society, right? So I think you educate a girl, you educate a family. So I think, you know, the, the sad thing is that you hear of these beautiful stories and courageous girls and women like Mahira, like Malala, like, you know, because the needs in countries like Pakistan is just overwhelming. And it, yes, it's very important to encourage NGOs. But I think what we need to do, and this is, this is a personal opinion here, not, not federation. I think what we need to do is also teach girls and women the, how to do really good advocacy. Because unless policies change, you cannot get that shift that you really need, right? And, and I think that there are enough very, very, you know, inspiring women like Mahira and, and boys and men uh, who come together. And I think for women to succeed as well, it's very important that men speak up. And you're very fortunate because um, you had the crazy five to speak up for you. And we've got to make a crazy, you know, how many million population? And she has the support from her father as well. Yes, and your father. And how many population in Pakistan? Remind me. Uh, I don't have 
many ideas. Okay. Well, <laughs> we have to have the crazy how many million in Pakistan to stand up and say that girls have a right to education and girls have a right to 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 be empowered and to not marry off at you know 15 but you're not alone huh? I, there are many countries even in the developed world where young girls are married off very early i shall not mention the nation but uh, i hope you know which one <laughs> uh, where young girls are also married off uh, after puberty so it's not exclusive to to pakistan um, but you know, build a coalition. This is my my advice. You build a coalition of people who will support you. You know, uh, we need to invest in people like you to do good advocacy and policy and, and shift policies. You also focus on partnership. Yes, you always ask for partnerships. Absolutely, this is the coalition and the partnership, right? I mean, the world is changing very very rapidly. Let me be very honest to say that. There's less trust in institution than individuals. So trust right now, you know, if you look at Edelman's trust barometer, the trust in institutions, whether it and governments are the highest, right? The lowest reduction in the highest reduction in trust, governments, corporations, even institutions, uh, um, uh, which are supposed to do good, right? So it's individuals and a distributed network of individuals that connect and actually form the basis of change. So I think you know. We have to figure and map that out as well. So partnership is key. Your partnership with Generation Amazing. We would love to connect you with our partners so that you can you know, grow your network of partners. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I would love to welcome our fourth speaker, His Excellency Hassan Dawadi, the Secretary General of the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy. Please welcome him. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, I, I apologize for coming in, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time for having to rush out. Uh, I've, I've unfortunately got a few commitments, so I apologize for that in advance. Uh, before we start, I'd like to just very briefly introduce a video, if it's okay. Football has changed my life. My name is Poonam. I live in Ambedkar Nagar, and I'm 19 years old. In my community, there are lots of pressure on women to marry in an early age. I've never used to believe that I will study and earn money, but through football and through my achievements, I feel I'm equal. I believe in gender equality because women should have the same chances as men. Nowadays, I'm playing in senior team and I coach under 10 kids two days a week. I feel through the coaching, I'm changing people's life. No. Through football, I want to help my family, my community, and my country. So, Your Excellency, good afternoon. Great to have you here. Before you joined us, we were talking about women's rights, equality, education, and many, many things that we can get from football. Tell us more about Generation Amazing, the idea about it, and the vision of the SC. Um, I think from the very beginning when we did bid to host the World Cup, our idea was to utilize this tournament as, as a catalyst for positive change and leaving a legacy. And uh, most people, when they hear legacy, they look at infrastructure. and How do you leave a legacy in terms of stadiums and so on? But I think the most important legacy that you can ever leave out of anything is, is, is humans. And how can you contribute to the development of uh, people um, on in different aspects of life um, and overcoming different challenges? There's no doubts, I think, especially, you know, we wanted to utilize the power of sports, the power of football, football for development, uh, to address and overcome a lot of challenges. Uh, and in particular, um, gender equality, issues of uh, utilizing football for development to develop uh, leadership skills, communication skills, civic engagement skills. Uh, so we launched Generation Amazing. It's been over 10 years. You know, we've, we've, uh, you know, the numbers uh, sound impressive when we talk about 500,000 beneficiaries over the last 10 years. But I think for me, what's most inspirational is, is when I meet people like Mahiro, honestly. Um, because regardless of the numbers, they sound absolutely fantastic. But when you see someone who, you know, I'd like to think that Generation Amazing was able to contribute even for s a small little bit uh, in any way, shape, or form to you, I think that's where the true inspiration is. Um, we've, uh, 
you know, again, I, I, I get emotional because it's, it's a moment where you actually see there is a benefit, there is a value going in, and there's hopefully a story that continues beyond 2022. So again, I want to thank you very, very much uh, for, for being here today. Of course, our partners, you know, you would never be able to do it without our partners, plain and simple. And uh, I'm looking for, you know, old partners and new partners. And we're going to be having our partners uh, to kind of develop, uh, the, the, leave the legacy and the lasting legacy of 2022 beyond this tournament. And I see you looking at your watch. I see Nelson also <laughs> looking at me. I have to rush out. I am so sorry. I wanted to continue and speak even more, but I have to rush out. I'm really, really sorry about this. Hopefully I'll finish very quick and come back. I'll catch up. Again, apologies. I'm very embarrassed about this, but sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you. So we would like to uh, thank His Excellency uh, Hassan Dawadi. He mentioned the continuity, which you were asking uh, about. And talking about uh, football again, I'm, I'm a football fan. And if we look at the best players in the world, we can always see a good example of talented players on field. But we can see that most of them are not educated enough off pitch. What is the message that you can say to the athletes, to the sports you know, entities, to the football clubs, to work more with these idols? Um, as, as a hobby, I'm a sports psychologist. I have a PhD, maybe you saw. So. I sometimes even support clubs and federations and, and players. Um, and I was working with the Serbian under-20 national team and they became world champions in New Zealand 2015. I was working with them and I was uh, telling them just one simple sentence. You will not become champions on the pitch if you're not champions in life and not champions in your community. And I think this as a, as a mantra, as a slogan, as, as, as a sentence needs to be in every agent's uh, handbook, in every club's president uh, official speech, in every coach uh, uh, locker room speech before the match. If you are not part of the community, if you are not giving back to where you come from, if you are not supporting young people on their way, you will also not ever be a champion on the pitch. If we are able to translate this into personal change of the players, I believe that they will also be able to transmit such messages beyond being influential on Instagram for Nike or Adidas. They should be also influential in educating young people about the values that we believe their sport inherits. I would like to give our regards to our colleague, Mr. Suar Dahab. He's a very famous uh, football commentator from BN Sports, who won also the award of Akhlaquna, our values here in Qatar, a few months back. And he also uh, was running a fantastic initiative in Sudan, helping poor people to get into schools and education. So we would like to know from you what's next. It's been five years, three more years for the World Cup, and many, many years to come for your initiatives. So um, I want to continue this work. I want to include the women in sports and education. because. I I'm not sure that in your country if it is difficult to um, engage women in sports and education, but in my country, in our part of the world, it is very difficult to engage women in sports and um, um, education. I do remember that it, back in 2015 when we organized um, uh, a first ever for female football league and tournament in Liari, we received threats. There were journalists who were against us and they, they said that we will be writing um, stories against you. You are you are allowing girls to play football, and you are you are going against our culture. So it was very difficult for me and my team at that time. But now I can proudly say that there are many organizations who are investing in girls football in Liari, and we have more than 25 female football clubs in Liari who are playing football. So I want to continue my work and I want to spread this work in, throughout the country. And we all want to visit Layari. We yeah. like Layari yeah. because of you. Welcome. Yeah, so we have there. about 10 minutes left, so I would like to open the floor for a few questions. Please. Uh, well, thank you for the great discussion, but my question is for Mahira. Um, I'm really interested in your challenge or facing your challenge, but I'm more interested in knowing more 
And knowing more how do you overcome uh, other than do, uh, other than finding some people to support you actually. But you didn't actually say are you still facing those uh, those threats or what happened to those people? How do you, how did you overcome them? So uh, when I started working in 2013, it was all normal. Uh, after a few months, they started threatening me because I was educating girls. And at that time, I was working in Chil Chok. If you can Google it, you will find that Chil Chok is the most uh, vulnerable area of uh, Liari itself. And it is considered um, the, the very bad area. It has the very bad image in, in Liari. And no organization is allowed to work there. So ours is the first organization that is working for women and is by, for, is by women. So it was very difficult for us to work. Um, then after finding C5, we shifted to another neighborhood of Liari. We are not working in Chilchok anymore because they were threatening us again and again. And for our safety and security, we moved to another neighborhood of Liari. Um, till now, I'm not uh, I'm not facing any challenges like this right now because I think when when uh, I uh, I will not say that I'm famous, but I will say that people know me now, and and they and they are they will not come to threat me. Hi, uh, good afternoon everybody. My name is Chandrasekhar. I represent Dream a Dream, which is an NGO based out of India. And uh, we use football to teach uh, life skills to, for kids from marginalized background. We've been doing that for almost 20 years. And I would like to thank Generation Amazing and uh, Street Football World because they've been su supporting us for a while. Yeah. My question is, uh, how do we take this forward? Yeah, how do we ensure that we work with policymakers and educators and uh, see uh, to introduce Sports as a medium to teach uh, young kids. Yes, how do we influence them? Yes, so that's my question. Vlad can answer your question. Yes, I will take it uh, gladly. Um, people who know me, they know I'm a revolutionary, a rebel, whatever. So let me pose a, a challenge also to to the World Innovation Summit on Education. Um, yes, we are all striving for whatever. Can hear you. We are all striving for. Um, mass education, to bring young people to schools, to, to prevent dropout, to bring them to education. My question to us is beyond mass education, what else can we do? And my proposition is let Mahira be the next president of Pakistan. Let the young girl go from youth leader in the community to become the political leader of the country. Let us not only focus on mass participation in education, but let us also focus on excellent leadership development through education. With that, I believe that in parallel, we can actually achieve world change and change not only the ground in your community, but also change the leaders of tomorrow. And tomorrow is tomorrow, not in 20, 30, 50 years. I want still to see Mahira changing world politics. I want to see the young people of Generation Amazing being the leaders of their society, not only of their community. I want every young person who is part of Generation Amazing to believe that he and especially her can change the world. With this attitude, we are bringing education also to the next level. And not thinking only about the mathematics and grammar, but we are thinking about leadership skills that the schools of tomorrow need to nurture in the young people. Dr. Jamila? Well, all I can say is Mahira has a better chance of becoming president of Pakistan than any other woman in my country <laughs> because they've had a woman president. So we're all for you. Um, I think that there are a couple of things. You know, if you want to see change, first of all, you need to build a body of evidence why change is important. So it has to be a systems approach. It's not... It's wonderful to say, let's pick a couple of people and make them president or become leaders, but it's about systems change. And to have a systems approach, you need to, first of all, build a body of evidence and have the right tools. So what I can say is that we have, as I mentioned earlier, the youth, of agents, youth as agents of behavioral change. It's a toolkit. Everyone can get it. Uh, go to your local Red Cross. You can, you can be trained. That, but what it does is it systematically teaches you to learn from each other about leadership, about xenophobia, about tolerance, about acceptance, about uh, gender, 
uh, and, and about peace, right? And then becoming a trainer after that so that you then impact your community. Because beyond the people on the football pitch and what we're trying to do now with the uh, Supreme Committee is not just teaching on the pitch, it's off pitch as well, right? And, and what's very important then is that you build that body of evidence and then engage the people who are probably going to be your biggest opponents and get them to see that what's good for them, right? What, how, why is this important? Uh, the economic benefits, people who go to work, you know, youth unemployment drops, whatever. Because as, as I, I will reiterate again, our model and approach of education today, if it's a conventional go to school, get a degree, is not going to prepare us for the jobs of the 21st century. Things are changing so quickly that it is about cognitive learning, coding, about values, it's about uh, being able to network social skills that actually forms the next leader. I can see you getting motivated and starting thinking about the presidency, <laughs> please. <laughs> I will speak in uh, Arabic, so please, if you want to switch your uh, translation tools. أنا اسمي هبة صباغ من الأردن صحفية أردنية. بدي أحكي لكم شغلة صغيرة من قصتي إنه أنا بلشت بال 93 وبهذاك الوقت يعني الكل كان يحكي لي وبالذات أهلي إنه مستحيل أنا أكون صحفية أشتغل في مجال الصحافة الرياضية مش مستحيل مستحيل مع هيك الأهالي بمطوعة. بهذاك الوقت يمكن تحديدا في الأردن كان مستحيل إنه بناتنا يلعبوا كرة القدم كان مستحيل إنه يكون في عنا على سبيل المثال نائبة في البرلمان الأردني كان مستحيل إنه يكون في عنا وزيرة في الحكومة الأردنية كان مستحيل إنه يكون في عنا في الدرك على سبيل المثال دركيات يشتغلوا في أمن الملاعب اليوم إحنا بال2019 أو بتحديدا 2016 الأردن نظم بطولة كأس العالم للسيدات تحت 17 سنة نظمنا كأس آسيا للسيدات والصحفية اللي كانت مستحيل تكون صحفية شغلت منصب مديرة إعلام كأس العالم للسيدات مديرة إعلام كأس آسيا للسيدات أنا أؤمن بأنه الرياضة هي منصة عالية التأثير وممكن أيضا تكون منصة للتغيير الاجتماعي فبشكركم ويمكن أنا كنت حريصة أن أحضر هذا تحديدا هذه المحاضرة يعني خصصتها من الأردن حتى أكون معكم فبالفعل أنا مآمنة بكل كلمة بتحكوها والحلم صار حقيقة كمان لما عم نشوف قطر عم بتنظم أيضا كأس العالم في منطقة عربية هذا الحلم بالنسبة لنا عم بتحقق شكرا لكم Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It appears the Jordanians have um, have arrived. Um, uh, my name is Ashtar uh, bin Al Hassan. I am the head of the Hashemite charitable organization in Jordan, and we're here today to sign uh, an MOU with Qatar, which will enable uh, refugee youth to work as volunteers uh, in the upcoming uh, World Cup. And it's something we're proud of. We can provide up to 10,000 uh, uh, refugees, and the process has already begun. I've heard the speakers speak a lot about leadership and preparing youth, cognitive skills, uh, uh, how to resolve, with, uh, resolve conflict. But uh, it appears to me that with a lot of these initiatives, be it through sport and through other development uh, tools, there is a, a disconnect in that we are preparing young people uh, we are giving them the tools to survive, uh, as Jamila in particular has, has focused on, but we are not preparing uh, them with vocations, with vocational training, or not finding the vocations. So it almost ends up with a situation where you have a highly motivated, developed uh, youth who has been given all the tools through programs like this and others throughout the world, and then suddenly, age 21, 20, uh, 22, you haven't taken that final step the gap between leadership uh, and um, I, I, I look forward to the contest between you and Malada, uh, uh, the, the gap between leadership uh, uh, and, um, uh, and between graduating these programs is earning vocation, contributing. And I just wonder what your thoughts are on how we look to develop and steer people who are beneficiaries of these programs. So we're not just um, feeling good about ourselves and doing the right things, but actually how we make that transitional step into finishing what we start by getting people into vocations, into jobs, so that they can stand on their, uh, on their own two feet. And then, uh, obviously, once the, that cycle begins, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy generation by generation. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you agree that there is a gap and how can we fill this gap? Well, for the purpose of this uh, discussion, I have not focused on livelihood because, uh, you know, that will be another hour of discussion. But we, we have, uh, you know, livelihood programs. We have 14 million volunteers around the world, uh, you know, and 50% are young people. So I completely agree livelihood is, is critical. But I also want to highlight that the future of work may not look like what it looks like today. So it's also about giving them skills of social entrepreneurship. Uh, what we do uh, is uh, actually a very widespread digital literacy course now because we feel the future is going to be digital. So unless you understand what di digital literacy, you cannot be engaged in digital, sort of the digital world of tomorrow. And then teaching people how to, you know, with small funds to become social entrepreneurs, but also carpentry, the usual stuff, but also coding, because I think that that's where, where future is. So. I apologize for the purpose of this uh, discussion. We couldn't bring in the livelihood, but I'm very happy to share with you what we do, which is which quite a lot. Yeah. Vlad, would you like to add anything? I wanted to give you a few examples how football can contribute, but I understand it's also uh, something that we can take off, off uh, platform. Uh, just to mention that uh, we are talking today, especially about the first sector where Mahira will be in a few years and the third sector where she is. We have also the second sector, which is the commercial partners. And uh, their engagement in football is becoming increasingly interesting because they are not anymore only sponsors. And I'll just give you an example of FedEx or Nissan who are focusing on youth employability through football. And I believe there, in that part of the society and that sector that is focusing more on the commerce, we can find some good partners who are advancing from leadership to employment and employment, meaning then also security for the family, and as you say, the next generation equipped with even more skills. So we'll take a final question. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm uh, Sukaina Tazi from Morocco. Uh, I'm working for uh, Moroccan NGO for education, but also at the same time, I'm uh, president and founder of uh, FI Football Association, which is an association that promotes uh, football uh, that promotes uh, equity through women football. Um, we are all waiting for the for the World Cup in Qatar, and uh, for all the legacies that uh, that uh, will be generated through the organization of such uh, uh, such uh, mega events in Arabic land. My question is: Otherwise, how does how the Supreme Council uh, of Legacy will use the FIFA World Cup? Uh, to develop women's football, especially in the Arabic area, um, and as an opportunity to develop at the same time equity and human development. Thank you. Maybe you can answer this question. It's more about uh, improving football for women in the region. Yeah, I, I'll, first of all, congratulations for your good work. Uh, looking forward to learning more because I didn't know about your organization in Morocco, so, so great to see there some progress on the ground. Um, I, I cannot take fully the question uh, because I would be probably not be hitting the, the right information and the right point. Um, you can take another example of yes, of yes, another I'll, part of the world. I'll take, world, I'll take world the example of the, of the FIFA World Cup that just happened in France. Uh, it was the Women's World Cup. I think we hear uh, and we saw an incredible headlines about the women's game development. Um, and uh, just to give you an idea, I mentioned the youth festival that will be hosted here in Qatar in mid-December. I am cordially inviting you to, co to, to be part of that and, and to, to observe it. On the other hand, we had uh, a festival in Lyon during the, the FIFA Women's World Cup uh, during this summer. Um, and I would like just to, to leave you with a slogan. It says, equality is everyone's game. So it's not just about the girls, the boys, the men or the women who are fighting for its rights. Equality is everyone's game. So it's the game of us four, it's the game of us all, and it's the game of humanity. How we can use the mega sports events really depends on the people who are behind. Here, I mentioned already in my introduction, I see a strong emphasis on social development. How exactly it will contribute to the women's game, I believe through Generation Amazing, we're already reaching 250,000 young girls. This is a contribution. It will be more. How the game of football through this will develop, it will also depend on the variety of partners who are behind, the federations, FIFA itself. I think if you're following football, FIFA just announced that it will double 
the investment into women's football as of this year. So it will be 1 billion US dollars. It's a huge investment. I do believe, and knowing the colleagues at FIFA, they will also look at its social dimension. So working hand in hand and looking forward also to learning more about the Moroccan experience, I believe that World Cups, mega sports events are an impetus, but it's again us who make the difference. We reached the end. I would like to thank you all for attending and listening. I would like also to thank my guest, Dr. Uh, Jamila Mahmoud, the Under Secretary of International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent. I would like also to thank Mr. Vladimir Borkovic, the CEO founder of Street Football World. And also I would like to thank Mahira Ahmed, the President of Women is Nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.